All right. Good day and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. Real quick for our newer listeners, make sure you hop on and get me some updated iTunes reviews of Live the Fuel. Uh, I am asking for new ones because I'm interested to see what people think after two and a half years of running this show. And uh, also, I'm looking forward to reading more of them on our live shows. But let me jump in for the newer listeners and the older listeners. We've got, yes, yet another new guest co-host for you. And uh, I'm actually excited about this because I literally just finished recording two other back-to-back -back podcasts tonight. And the last two asked me how I keep my office so clean. And I'll give you a hint. I might have a little bit of OCD uh, or for our guest co-host today, I might have some attention to detail. And there's a little hint, hint. So today's new guest co-host, he's a researcher, trainer, consultant, and business owner. And when he's not running a business or spending time with his family, he is researching attention to detail or helping others become more detail-oriented. This guy runs workshops and seminars and a whole lot more. So without further ado, the attention to detail.com man himself, Chris Denny, welcome to the show. Hey there. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So uh, is my office fit and attention to detail? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's, you have symmetry most people don't have, so uh, that's, that's pretty nice. I've not yeah. heard that one yet. So I mean, right behind you, there's, you know, it's right in the middle of the screen is, is well, first of all, the separation between the shelves, mm -hmm. and then in the middle on top is the, I can't totally tell what that is, but maybe a trophy or... Uh, well, your the, logo. Yeah, it's, yeah, so that, so that is one of my followers. He, cool. he, he does handcrafted wood signs, and that was part right. of a, uh, my because I just got married last month, so that was a wedding gift he brought over a couple weeks ago. He has been trying to do that for like a year and a half because That's he's cool. taken my flame, and he's literally like hand carving it out of wood. It's crazy. Yeah. And it actually lights up. He embedded, I got to do this for you real quick. This is a great Good. podcast, by the way. <laughs> So the problem is it's so bright. He he right. played like what do you, what is it? LEDs? The, uh, yeah. LEDs around the entire perimeter in, inside a rim of the wood. But on on video, it's so darn bright. You, <laughs> right. I don't even think you can see the fire, can you? It's just no. yeah. So because in my logo, I like to burn white hot. Um, okay, gotcha. Uh, you know, I tell people the on the on the on the heat spectrum. Uh, the hotter flames, like the like the stars in the universe, are, are usually yeah. a white or a, a blue level of flame. So, anyway, so he he clearly nailed the white hot. That's cool. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, I I I'm nice. not kidding you. I actually I I flipped this office about a month ago. Those bookcases used to be over here. This desk used to be in that corner, and I just like to freshen things up like every year or two. So I did a complete flip. My wife, well, not wife, she was like, why does it matter? And I say, because I just need a new perspective. Mm -hmm. Plus, I needed to change space for my road bike. Uh, I'm a big cyclist, and I needed to do some training. So I said, great, let's change the layout. Uh, I can hop on webinars and just pedal my bike. <laughs> <laughs> wow. but yes, I will say symmetry. I measured the distance from the door seam to the edge of the bookcase and that bookcase to the corner. Whoa. I had to dead center that sucker. <laughs> Nice. I call it OCD. You call it symmetry. Right. Your brand calls it attention to detail, apparently, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So am I normal? Not normal? What's going on? <laughs> and there's all kinds. It, uh, frankly, it's, it's all about whatever's important to you, right? So for some people, that's not important at all. Okay. For you, that matters. It just, it, it kind of makes you click up here, right? So to my so, wife, it's not yeah. important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've got the same thing. I mean, People expect me to do stuff like that. I don't, and uh, because it's not important to me, right? Um, so, I, so interesting. So you're saying people who work with you would expect you, and admittedly, from the surface level, and I'm new to getting to know you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the guy who owns AttentionToDetail.com. Yeah, I would think that symmetry and measuring and all that stuff meant a lot to you too. Yeah, but you're saying it doesn't, per se about certain things right okay, so if it I'm all about if it's relevant right if I'm creating something for an audience and I'm pretty sure that audience is going to like that will matter to them hmm. so for example if that was my office and I was using it 
four podcasts, yeah, that's that's what I would do. If it was just my office and it's just my office, mm -hmm. I don't care at all. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't have a video camera here all the time and this is going right. to be my backdrop, yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I mean, gosh, my office, um, I can't say it's the tidiest office in the world by any means. But you're not doing live video from it. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because trust me, that dresser right there is actually my, this, this, this office before I met my wife, this is actually was her great grandmother's house. Okay. And so when I met her and then we decided to move in together, this was her second closet. And I was like, I'm, I'm using air quotes, by the way, uh, because I'm on, I'm on video, but the, for the listeners out there, I'm air quoting closet. And I was like, what do you mean your closet? That's just another bedroom and it's, I'm going to make that my okay. office. And she's like, well, no, that's been my closet. And I said, but you have actual closets. So yeah. you don't need a whole room for that. I mean, there was an ottoman in here. There was all kinds of stuff. So through the patience of building a relationship, I was able to earn this space. Yeah. But I, she still gets that wall. So that wall is still hers. <laughs> I just ask her to keep it clean, uh, put stuff away. At least up to there, like that point right there that you can see on the, is there just a bunch of clutter in this corner of the room? <laughs> normally there is. Uh, but I figured out where she normally puts the stuff in the separate drawers. So now if she hasn't done it, I put the stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. Pull them open and like scrape into it. Yeah. There, there is a bunch of stuff sitting there though because um, we just got married last month. So we, uh, we have a lot of cool things I brought back from uh, we were in Banff in the Alberta province of Canada cool. and also skiing in British Columbia. So I picked up a cool pieces of like ski theme art that I need to sit down and get some framing for and do some right. more framing and change up the decor in here. So, yeah. Um, again, it, is just, it goes with the brand, right? It's, I'm an adrenaline junkie adventure sports. So right. I'll be doing further symmetry work on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you, you don't have this problem at all. <laughs> no, I don't. People are usually surprised. They, they kind of expect me to be, yeah, a little uptight about, you know, what I'm wearing and just where things are placed and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm typically a really relaxed guy. Okay. Pretty casual anyway. Um, I mean, when I do workshops, unless, you know, I'll, I'll mirror the audience, right? But, but typically my workshop attire is jeans, nice jeans, jeans, sports coat, that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm a little more casual than usual right now, but. I agree with but, you. Uh, I, I really I, do suits and ties. Tomorrow I'll be traveling with my biggest client and we're going down to Southern New Jersey and, and uh, the, the niche is the HVAC industry. So I, I love what you just hinted at here, adapting to your audience, right? Yeah. I'm not going to walk in to a distributor. These are, these are business to business relationships. So these big distributors is where all the contractors go and shop at. So the guy yeah. or, or girl who's fixing your HVAC system goes and buys that stuff from a professional distributor. Mm -hmm. That's what we work with. So I'm going to go down there. We're going to have, we're going to do some uh, buyer meetings, but I'm going to go in with a nice pair of dress shoes, a nice pair of dress jeans, Yep. And then a button down shirt. I don't even wear, I don't even rock the sport coat. Now right. the old, older guys in that industry that have been doing sales and marketing for a long time, they're still wearing the suits and the sport sure. coat and sure. no, nobody bats an eye at me. And the funny thing is in the past couple of years of us doing business together, I've noticed that these top influencer influencing buyers, 70% mm -hmm. of them now wear jeans. Some of them oh, still really? rock the khakis and the slacks. So yeah. it's very interesting uh, to the audience adaptation. Yep. So is that part of the science behind your brand? Oh, I'm not going to say it's that official. I, it's more about uh, being authentic. You know, I just, I don't want to try to pretend to be somebody who I'm not. I'm, okay. So it feels like sometimes people expect me to come in in like a three piece suit with you know, the kerchief and like really. Yeah. Just, you're just dialed out to the nines, man. You're like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But frankly, that's another thing I have to do. And there's already a lot going on when you're trying to put together a three and a half hour workshop. And I'm, you know, remembering the, the details and, and of course I want to get, I just need to make sure I state the important points. And if I'm worried about what I'm wearing, that's just a little bit more going on up here that isn't really me. And you know, I, I'm, I'm all about, I'm all about being me. Yeah. And uh, I just want to get the value to the audience. So yeah, if it doesn't really match, then I don't want that cognitive dissonance going on. So what I'm hearing here is that, and you being the expert here on attention to detail, so I'm intrigued here. So I mean, you own the trademark attention to detail training, you know, your system. 
Mm -hmm. um, which again, that makes sense having that attention to detail because you <laughs> own your brand. So right. well done. Uh, you know, I, I've TM'd, you know, live the fuel. So that's my brand. Cool. Um, I, it's interesting. So do you feel some of us or people in your workshops, do you think some of us maybe have too much attention to detail in the wrong areas? And that's what's leading to stress in our lives, personally and professionally? Have you seen this? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's the point is that it, that's where some of the stress comes from. People are worrying about the same things. Um, I don't think my wife's going to listen to this, but you know, she's one oh, of the my wife's not going to listen to it. She's <laughs> right? like, I hear, I hear you enough in the house. I don't need to listen to your show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but she is a good example of that where it, it, she worries too much about different things and she wants to make sure she gets this right and that right and that right. And when you're putting, when you're doing something like putting together an event, mm -hmm. I think that might be where it comes from. She used to do a distinguished events for uh, like big nonprofits and that sort of thing. And there, every little detail really, really matters. But in a lot of cases where you're just trying to get something done, you're you know, trying to get a, a kind of usual task done, some people will worry too much about things that are unimportant. And uh, you know, at some point you're just being a little pedantic even, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just causing undue stress. So that's why I like to use the word meaningful a lot. Um, cause you don't have to get everything right all the time, but you need to get the meaningful right things right all the time, or at least as much as possible, you know, to keep things flowing smoothly. So, so is that a big chunk of your workshops is like, obviously first I'm guessing helping the audience ease into the process, yeah. get people relaxed. And that's obviously your advantage too. Like if you, you were the leading the workshop, mm -hmm. and you are not comfortable having to get dressed up in a full blown suit. And you were done and you did that, yeah. I guess you've been already throwing off the presentation, the flow, like you would be too uptight uh, yeah. and you wouldn't be a, your relaxed self. So yeah. I, I've told people that for years when it comes to sales and marketing and, and like public speaking is like, you know, be in order for you to be yourself, be yourself. Don't fake it. Right. Like there's this, there's this, oh my God, there's this popular quote online. I know you know what I'm talking about where people use the whole, well, you got to fake it till you make it. Oh yeah. You know? And I've used it here mm -hmm. and there, but in right. the right situation. Right. How would you connect that for people hearing this right now from your world of that attention to detail, your workshops? Like, what do you think about that quote? How do you connect on that? Yeah, it's funny because I have used it. Because, <laughs> but we all have. We all have. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's more about in that, uh, where I typically would say it applies is in that sort of entrepreneurial way where people go like, hey, how's it going? And even if you're having a bad day, you might just go, man, things are awesome. You know, I, I mean, everybody does that sort of thing. And that's, I think it's a mental game thing. You right. got to like flip the mental trigger. Exactly. Just kind of keeping it going where I don't think it's appropriate is, um, you shouldn't act like you know what you're doing. If you really have no clue about what you're doing, because that's just going to lead to the train wreck you're expecting a huge train wreck, huge train. Yeah, wreck. yeah. absolutely. And, and people should be comfortable enough to say, I don't get it. You know, I've, I've literally caught people like, listen, I, I'm actually coaching somebody right now. Actually, my client who I'm traveling tomorrow, her, her, her sales guy in, in the new England region of the country. Yeah. And I've told him that before. I was like, listen, it's like when you were new, he, I think she hired him two years ago. And I said, listen, you're new. You're new to her industry. You're new to the profession. Be yourself and be yeah. honest. Like let them know when you start holding these meetings with these buyers, whatever, like, you're going to be nervous. Tell them that you're new. Right. Play the new guy card. Like you'd be surprised. There's a lot of professionals out there that just feel bad for you and then throw you business because they just they feel bad for you. Right. But then if you kind of come in, you try and come in and act like you know everything and that you're a industry expert and you have zero industry experience, you're going to crash and burn. They're going to yeah. nail you. It's Absolutely. Like, oh. it, they'll sniff that out in a second because the, the experienced guys know what the new guys are going to get wrong on the first day. Like they could just go and tell you, Hey, you're going to, you're going to screw up on this. So watch it. Mm -hmm. And and if you try to act like, Oh no, man, I got that covered. Like you say, you're, you're done. You're toast. And, I mean, and they don't want to help you anymore because you didn't listen. So do, do you find on this, this, this fun little thread that you and I are on right now, do you find this coming up in your workshops or in your seminars, but also connecting on the personal front? 
or, is, or are you always trying to keep everything more obviously on the professional side? Because I feel like this, this totally has to do with personal lives as well. I don't, want, I don't want to call it lying, but just <laughs> professional fib, overselling you in the itself in the dating process. I don't know. How would you call this? <laughs> <laughs> it does. I don't. So obviously people that pay me to do this, they, you know, they, they want to stay focused on the business side of it. Um, if it comes into the personal part, it's usually because someone asks a question or something like that. The, the parts, yeah, I don't, I don't usually address it from a, on a personal level, like with dating or something like that, where I might is if people talk about, you know, they need attention to detail with the things they're doing or um, things you're doing around the house or maybe, maybe in a marriage or relationship, that, that sort of thing. Um, but it's the same principles as with, as with uh, professional setting. It, it's, it's the same fundamentals. Well, I look at it from a, a behavioral analysis component. So like when I, when I, I, I put myself through school on nights and weekends as an adult student. So, mm -hmm. and then I started taking some psych classes and the next thing you know, I ended up falling in love with psychology and then I'm trying to do, <laughs> pull off a dual major. And then I realized, wait a minute, unless you plan on going to the PhD level, like you're not really going to make any money or have any success in psychology. Right. Right. So I was like, eh, good. The marketing is done. I'll graduate with a BS instead of a BA and I'll keep the psych as a minor. Yeah. But, and I don't use any of the marketing that I learned in college, FYI. <laughs> but I still pull and tap into all the psychology. I love it. And yeah. It's come up on the show since I found the show repetitively in different ways. And the biggest thing that I love is the behavioral analysis component because mm -hmm. what you and I are talking about right now, I feel, is it's a behavior that you may have learned incorrectly or inappropriately if you're using it in a, in a negative connotation. Sure. It's like you have to get that reprogrammed. Yeah. And I do see the crossover personal to professional and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, we won't be talking about a different subject, but there's still the underlying behavior that is right. affecting the personal versus the professional, right? Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so, so like in the workshops, um, the first thing we start out with is, is gaining a common understanding. So, you know, we define it and we talk about what there are three types of attention to detail. And, and I think that's, you know, from a structural standpoint, you know, it goes, it, it actually kind of works well with psychology because hmm. you end up with all these models and just breaking things down and, at the end of the day, you're like, well, yeah, it's just doing it better or it's just thinking or, you know, it's, it's uh, maybe you're breaking out a little too much. And, and you can do that with just about anything with, you know, so many business concepts and all that. But there are three types of attention to detail, contrastive, analytical, and additive. And so okay. we, we break those down to make sure everyone kind of understands that. Because, let's, hit, let's hit those threes again because that came off really fast. What are those sorry, three again? Sorry. Contrastive, mm -hmm. analytical, okay. and additive. Additive, okay. Yep. And and uh, and I, and I'll I can break them down more a little. You know, the, the concepts are simple, but the idea of understanding them is that then you can go, okay, this is the kind I'm dealing with, and I need to label it properly and address it, and then build systems around it or think about it in a certain way. Uh, you know, but by giving it some structure, it's a little easier to to address it. So especially okay. in at an individual level or like in a work setting, you know, where you're dealing with a team or often it's a manager who has one or two people that they would like to be more detail oriented. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, even saying detail oriented or attention to detail, it's, it's, um, sort of a clinical way of saying they're making mistakes on this specific thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, let me explain. So contrastive, attention to detail is the main deal to remember there is that there's one solution. Like it's either black or white or yes or no. Or it's oh, that, con that contrast. Or it's I, I, right, right. Now I'm clicking on it. it but, matches, but do, you, do you have these three defined on your site? Uh, they are. Yeah. I've made a video about it. So oh, okay. that, there's probably a blog post. A screen sharing here, by the way, again, oh, ladies cool. and gentlemen, it's attention to detail.com. Oh, I, cause I was poking around in here this evening and I was just wondering if it's obviously it's part of your course content. Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. It's in the course in the workshops. Um, Oh man, I don't get me uh, navigating the site right now. Uh, uh, you don't have to. It's fine. Okay, cool. I'm poking be, around while you're talking. Okay, cool. It'd be under articles, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so it, 
it uh, and it's in the book, which actually came out last week. So I'm kind of stoked about that. That's uh, true. Yeah. So I'll, I'll we'll be linking that in the blog article content as well. Oh, yeah. I'll send you a link. Actually, yeah, that's a that's a page on here for sure. So yeah. Um, so contrastive. That's the big deal. Is it's you know it matches or it doesn't. There's one solution, and the other part of that is that it's very systemizable, right? So uh, that's where contrastive attention to detail is why the big fast food chains can be run by 16 year olds. You know, you have these billion dollar organizations that are largely operated by kids. Well, it's all just simple, clean systems. It's yes or no. You follow exactly. this procedure. Boom, 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 boom. Exactly. You don't have to know how to make a hamburger. You have to know who, like how to recognize that something's flashing and beeping and press the button and, you know, take it out. Um, and then, by the way, I don't eat fast food, but every once in a while, if I'm traveling on business and there's nothing else nearby, I'll, I'll swing in one of those and use their right. bathroom, you know, but <laughs> you know, every time I've walked into one of those places, that's, that's all I hear in the background is the beep, beep, all the beeps. <laughs> right. Uh, then you've got analytical attention to detail and, and that's where you get into more possible solutions. So, okay. um, this is where most knowledge workers operate on a day to day basis. This is where you're taking a handful of elements and trying to identify which are relevant and which are not mm. and making us, you know, developing a solution or set of solutions maybe around them. So which one is, whereas with contrastive, which one is right or wrong is completely objective. It, it either is or it's not, you know, two plus two is always four every time with analytical. Think about it in terms of, um, you know, hey, create the best solution for, make the best business decision for this scenario. There may be three options and two of them may be almost just as good as the other, you know? Okay. And then additive is about innovation. That's about improvement. That's, that is the most complex for sure. And uh, it's very hard because it's about innovation. It's very hard to systemize it, but you can systematize a process for how to find what to innovate. Right. So, so uh, that's great. I just like to make sure people have this basic understanding of. So you're saying out of all three, the additive is the most complex, maybe? Absolutely. Okay. Because there's so many variables. Yeah. It, well, it's about creating something new. So okay. it, it's, it's certainly hard to systematize and you have to have a high degree of knowledge and understanding of, of the concepts you're trying to innovate or, you know, or improve. So um, there are, I'm not a specialist in innovation, but I know, I know a few mm -hmm. and they will take up walls with sticky notes because they're trying to identify every single element for a company, you know, because you're looking at customers and competitors and your current products and what you have and what's in the future and what's possible and not and what's, uh, and then what matters and what doesn't matter and what customers want and what they don't know they want and all of these things. So, I, I mean, the ultimate example for that is, is typically Steve Jobs where, you know, he, he had this additive attention to detail that was basically so specific in his mind that it was almost contrastive. I mean, because hmm. if you look up stories about, you know, working for him, it's like, Oh, it was, it was harsh. I mean, I, yeah. I watched, I watched all the documentaries. I've read the books. Right. Um, he was such an innovator, right. but if it, if you strayed too far from his vision, Exactly. It, was, it was cutthroat. It was, exactly. it was not awful. It had, exactly. to, it had to align with his innovation vision. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And he had Which is weird impressive. because, because Apple it, it symbolizes being state of the art and innovative, <laughs> Right. but it's funny how you and I are talking about that right now. And I don't, I don't think I've ever geeked out about it until right now. It's like, yeah, it was innovative, but you're innovative as long as you do what I want. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's interesting because like, I mean, I, I will say, I don't know about you. Are you an Apple user? Or are you a Droid? I'm not. I'm actually an Android. And Okay. Well, as an yeah. Apple user, even though everything here at my desk is all Windows, uh, but uh, my, I'm an, uh, we have an iPad and I, I'm an iPhone guy. Yeah. And I can't, I still have my 6S iPhone because I'm looking at all the new stuff and they changed the charging jack and now everything is dependent on one stupid little you know, <laughs> USB-C jack. And I'm like, no, I don't agree with that. I want to be able right. to plug my headphones in on a separate jack. So I'm, I purposely are using old tech because I don't, and usually I'm very good about embracing change. I actually yeah. coach it and recommend it. But in this situation, I'm like, I just thought that I saw, I thought that was not innovation. I was like, you yeah. are looking to make money because Steve's gone now. And it's like, wait a minute. 
user friendliness, that's not user friendliness because if I have my phone charging, I can't plug my headphones in. Yeah. You know, so driving a car. So I think if Steve hadn't have passed away, mm -hmm. I don't know if he would allow that new innovation to have actually occurred because even though he was innovative, he definitely cared a lot about the consumer and yeah. giving them an amazing experience. Yeah. And when they made that change, they pissed a lot of people off. Man. <laughs> I mean, granted, they were crushing it in the accessory income market because they right. forced everybody to have to upgrade all of your accessories. So right. you knew why they did that. Cause I, oh, yeah. I did. I'm like, they're going for money. That's money. No, it was for you. What do you mean? <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. They had an additive to their already proven system, right. which in turn generated millions of dollars in, in, in accessory sales alone. So, right. Yeah. I love it. Okay. See, I'm very analytical. I actually, maybe you can, here's a fun little exercise. This is All for right. benefit of the listeners, but I'm going to give my own backstory. The cool. long-term listeners know that when I created Live the Fuel, I went through my own branding exercise. I was excited. You know, I wanted something that, that came from my, my former firefighting background. I had the flame. Okay. So I was like, okay, I got to figure out something with a flame. And, I, and I, I, I was very into just start getting content out there that was motivational and inspirational. So I did, it's funny you brought up post-its. Uh, where I used to live, I covered a whole wall in post-its mm -hmm. and then just started writing word, key words down. Because okay. I spent time in the corporate world. I spent time, obviously, firefighting with the federal government. And whether you're corporate or government, or pretty much nowadays, anybody, there's acronyms everywhere. So everybody's words have an acronym. And so I was like, wait, what if I came up with my own acronym? So I actually live the fuel actually stands for once I narrowed down my keywords and I could create a sentence out of it, all these post-its took a couple of days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I came up with live the fired up epic life. Okay. Which is live the fuel. Yes. So fuel, well, I wanted fuel fired to be the fuel. action word fired up epic life. I wanted to be motivational and inspirational. I threw those words around probably way too much. Um, <laughs> you know, but the point was it had a purpose. And then in the beginning that was everywhere. And then over the past few years, it just shrunk and I just went with, with the fuel and that was just that. Right. So, but what is that exercise? Is that analytical? I mean, I, I don't think it was really contrastive because it was brainstorming. Yeah, yeah, not contrast for sure. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a lot of overlap, right? So you were trying to create something new and you were trying to put it, put it all together. I'm not sure where I would put that, to be honest. I feel um, it's like a balance between analytical and additive. Maybe. Yeah, and it's, okay. just a, it's, just, it's just a label. And there's a lot of mix between. Like one requires the other. So that's... That, oh, oh that's, that's interesting. Connection. Yeah, so like maybe this will help is that you're always trying to move towards contrastive from the standpoint of reducing the potential for human error and, and making it more systemi systemizable mm -hmm. um, and removing the need for knowledge. So that's where it, which is what a system does in a lot of cases, right? Right. So you kind of, I would say you kind of had a mix there because you were, you're laying everything out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're trying to create cloud something. thinking. <laughs> yeah. So you're trying to get something new, right? And that new thing is, your brand, your, you know, your logo, your motto, like the, yeah. the visible, visual representation of you, right? Mm -hmm. The verbal representation of you. So I'm going to, I'm going to call it more analytical than, than additive, but it has that additive component because you're creating something new, but really. Which, which is one of my strengths, by the way, have you ever, have you, have you guys ever incorporated into your uh, seminars, like uh, books, like the strengths finder 2.0 from Tom Rath? Not that one, but okay. I do. I mean, I include and recommend. You're familiar with that one? Handful of books. No, I haven't. I haven't run across that one. Oh, so God. Right Are you kidding me? Oh. No, I'm not. Strengths Finder 2.0. It's I have it digitally and physically behind me. Okay. Um, it's so you know about all these online analytical things you can go on and analyze your 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 who you are and how you think. Oh yeah. It spits back data, right? Right. So he, his system years ago, and it's, it's called 2.0 because he's re-released it a couple times. Okay. He's got other versions for executives and everything else. But long story short, you buy the book and it lists all these strengths that okay. you could have, but you don't read the book. You tear open the, the code, the code uh, page. It gives you your own online code. You go into their website and you do your, uh, 
psychological analysis, if you want to call it that. Very interesting. It spits back your top five strengths. Okay. And then you only read those sections of the book. Now, those, those, those five chapters or your yeah. five strengths, the chapter will expand on that strength. It'll list okay. what it means, how it applies, how it could relate to your personal and professional life, maybe okay. trying to find a career path, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But okay. the whole theme behind it is you could be spinning your wheels trying to fix a weakness that you yeah. have, or you could channel most of your energy into the, your natural strengths that you actually bring to the table. You never realized it. Right. And this, this hopefully helps you solidify that. It doesn't mean you have to stop working on your weaknesses, yeah, sure. but from an efficiency standpoint, what if you could channel all of your success through those strengths? Right. Right. So, I don't know. It, it's That's cool. I'll check it out. Yeah. I, I recommend it to all my clients. I mean, my client that I'm traveling with tomorrow, I put her whole team through it last year. Yeah. Um, as a team building exercise. Cause I said, listen, it's like each of us, even me as a, as a contractor, each of us bring different strengths to the table. Sure. Well, what if you're working on a project and the, I'm doing all the analytical crap, even though I am analytical, <laughs> but I'm doing all the analytical crap. And, but then, you know, Johnny over here is also just as analytical. So shouldn't yeah. he and I be teaming up? Yeah. Or, or maybe I was, maybe I'm not naturally analytical, but he is, but I'm doing all the analytical crap. It's like, wait a minute. No, Johnny's the analytical guy. Look at his strengths uh, analysis. Let's yeah. have him run with that and take him off. Of, so it, it's just seeing if you can help align people to better area right. of focus, I guess. Okay. So it does get into, into interpersonal. Oh yeah. And how oh yeah. Interact and, okay. I loved it. It was great because it, it really, I feel um, it does help people communicate better. Okay. It helps you understand why people think a certain way. Okay. Right? Is it like a disc-based system? Or? Kind of, yeah. I think they might channel. I think disc might be – his system is built off of other systems. So I think okay. disc, disc might be – by the way, ladies and gentlemen, disc is – what does this stand for? I forget now. Um, <laughs> Don't get me lying. <laughs> again, it's one of those analysis is like, you know, it's like, I remember, oh my God, I remember years like ago. Driver, intellectual. Yeah, it's. Whatever, I don't know. These are all personality tests. Yeah. That's a long story short is. Right. Uh, but I can remember, I never knew what any of that stuff was until years ago. I felt lost in my career. This is before firefighting. I was in my 20s. <laughs> and oh, what was the famous book? What color is your parachute? Oh yeah. Remember yeah. that one? Oh yeah. I think that's still out. They probably have re-released that a couple of times. Uh, I ran across it the other day. It, it, like it was just on the shelf in the airport or something. It was, um, it's a classic, but it's on like, it's on version five or eight or something. I was surprised. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was a bunch. But the, the point, the point I'm going with this here is that, um, I learned that one, I'm a, one of my strengths according to his book is I'm a wooer. So obviously I do public speaking. I'm in sales and marketing consulting. Okay. I have a podcast show. I have no problem going live on Facebook. Right. Clearly I have no problem getting in front of people. Mm -hmm. so I woo people. So that's a strength. <laughs> uh, I could have guessed that one. Right. Uh, but you know, being uh, analytical is also one of my strengths. Mm -hmm. And part of that analysis is actually uh, not from his book, from another uh, personality test I did. It said I was a spatial thinker. And that's why I, tra I translate that to cloud thinking, as we were just talking about. Okay. Because not everybody can kind of break it up into that cloud view. I'm using yeah. my hands for the people listening to this right now. It's on the video. <laughs> but not everybody can just, boom, blow it up. And I can see all the components, and then I can start funneling it down. And the reason why I'm saying this, because I want to hear how you connect it. When I'm looking, because I, I wrote this on my dry erase board here next to me, mm -hmm. The contrastive, the analytical, the additive. You listed them in those orders, but it's interesting though because you're really saying that you start at you know it more additive, which is that cloud. Then you start getting more analytical, and then if you're really truly trying to establish a quality system or protocol for people to follow, you eventually reach that contrastive level. Yeah. So yeah. I, I feel like the cloud is like additive, and then that honed structured system, the, the final phase is going to be the contrastive. Yeah, it can be. And, and they don't have to be, you know, it's not necessarily that you are always going to be dealing with all three additive okay. is it's really the innovation part. That's, that's kind of the part where things change, improve, you know, so 
a lot of times that's not um, that won't be used. I mean, a lot of people are never are never going to use that, and if they do, they're really just kind of bumping up against it okay. because just trying to kind of pick the best solution, the best way to you know run the meeting or or make the new fix the product or whatever isn't it doesn't have to be additive. You know, it just might be that hey, we're looking like we have these things, we have these uh, these elements, mm -hmm. and if we put this one with this one, then that's pretty good. If we put these three together, that's pretty good. Uh, so, yeah, the, the big deal, though, is that the first time you do it is going to be the hardest, right? Okay. Well, from a, from a group standpoint, and certainly, and from an individual standpoint, if you're going to do it a second time, try to do what you can to create systems around it. So like, like for my, from, for my business, I tell the guys, if you're going to do it more than once, write a process. I mean, just go ahead and, and write a process, write this down, make a checklist or whatever. So that next time you don't have to learn how to do it again or remember even. You can well, also, your cognitive resources can just go into do it. I love your hitting on this because I spent a, a couple years as an analyst and I worked in a, in the methods and procedures team okay. of, of the T-Mobile USA, which is the cool. cell, com cell company. So yeah. our whole purpose, well, at least my team was analyzing the existing protocols and systems and methods being used by the front line of the customer service. So when you called like, you know, customer service, yeah. they had 11 different call centers. Well, let me tell you, if you're going to try and have 11 different call centers <laughs> of 400 to 600 personnel, Wow. following the same methods and procedures. Yeah. You might be doing a little bit of analysis and you might be developing <laughs> processes to follow. <laughs> right. Just maybe. Yeah, just maybe. But the point that you're, I love what you're hinting at here is that, well, if you don't at least document phase one as yeah. a process, well, what do you have to go back to for editing or, or improving upon it? Right. Or like to your point, like getting additive. Yeah. Until you document it, you don't know if there's something to be in, you know, improved with innovation or something. Right. Right. That's where you're really trying to identify all the, you know, with additive, you're trying to, your first step is typically identify all the possible elements. Okay. Once you do that, then you can dig into each of those things and you're going to find what you can innovate around, you know, okay. because you, it's hard to just go like, let's innovate. <laughs> yeah, we should improve something, you know, but what? And so, and that needs to be meaningful. I mean, you're, if you're talking about a big, a big company, yeah. then they can either just throw millions of dollars at something and hope it sticks. Which or, happens, happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they can, the budget. they can use a system and a process and, and really you know, pinpoint instead of let's just throw our $100 million at a handful of things and hope it works out, let's pick three or four or five things and, uh, and do it in a very systematic way. So do you find then that with your – your trainings, your courses. Cause like, I mean, obviously you, you've owned a, a marketing agency for mm -hmm. years, but you have a team running that part because it allows you yeah. to do all this speaking and everything else. Right. So do you find that, do you actually have a, your process? Okay. For your brand, do you have a, a target audience? Because it's great to maybe land some big corporation who has a crazy huge budget to spend on, like you, you just kind of joked around about but then again, it's like, well, that's, is that really the right kind of client? Because like, well, guys, yeah. you're going to keep slapping money on the problem because you can afford <laughs> to. You're not really hearing what I'm saying. Do you find yourself targeting more of the small to mid-sized you know, organizations because they need what it is you teach? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So actually my, my clients usually end up being mid-sized companies okay. or um, sometimes they're bigger they're, they're quite a bit. And what is mid size? Like 500 personnel plus? Yeah. Yeah. It's 500 to some really big number. Like yeah. I don't even remember the exact number, you know, 20,000. It's, it's, okay. it's pretty large. Um, usually the people that call me and, and I don't do a ton of outbound, you know, outreach at this point. Okay. Uh, I'm actually about to start a campaign because the book is out and I can put more time into it and all that stuff. So, the people that call me are typically uh, from mid-sized companies, typically fairly growth oriented. And of course, ones that put a lot of emphasis on training, like on their people. So that's kind of a cool thing because a lot of the companies I go visit are really interesting because they really invest in their people a lot. Yeah. And um, so they are typically having problems with uh, task accuracy or mistakes that kind of keep happening and they can't really identify why the mistakes keep happening. And um, we're, well, in every case, uh, I'm working with office personnel. 
So okay. it could be could be engineers, could be compliance team, and it could be uh, receptionist. I yeah. mean, it, it's across the board. So oh, it's from front line to midline, right? I mean, right. Do you find yourself obviously getting honed down to the the CEIO level? Probably not. They're the ones right. paying paying for you to come in. <laughs> right, right. But typically, the person who who I um, hear from is it's one of three people. It's the talent talent development person, like the director of talent development, something like that. Mm-hmm or uh, a VP level, and could just be that the company is that size, that that's the person that takes care of it, or it's a receptionist, like it's, a, it's an admin, uh, and it could be that somebody just said, hey, we need training for that, go you know, go find somebody. And they track you down. <laughs> right, yeah, it, but in every case, it's, it's one of those three. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's funny how it could literally start with somebody, I mean, he or she could be the hero. If you're just an admin assistant and you, right your task to go find this right and you come in and you like completely flip that organization on a positive yeah it all goes back to hey man i was just (laughs) the admin i'm the one who found him (laughs) i mean that that is what i'm going for i mean i I want you know working at the individual level i want to make something of a of a bump of a a shift for the create like a a hero from the unexpected hero in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just want them to have a little lift in productivity. If everybody gets just two things a little more correct every day, yeah, then that's kind of a bump for everybody. I mean, you know, if, if, uh, if everybody makes fewer mistakes in emails or in the TPS report or whatever that they send to the next person. Classic connection. Yeah. (laughs) For the listeners, that would be the office space. Right. Uh, if you've ever sat in a cubicle, you need to watch that movie. It's a classic. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, is that still a popular movie? Or like, has anybody thought about so. that in ten years? Because I mean, was that the '90s or was that early 2000s? That was like late, late '90s. But I don't think it became popular until the early. Oh yeah, it, it's. I mean, oh, it's a classic. <laughs> I can eat that forever. You got Jennifer Aniston in it. Yeah. I mean, oh yeah, I mean, and the baseball bat to the printer. I mean, oh, come on. Awesome. great exercise, by the way. So. Um, <laughs> And actually, well, hold on, I'm going to do some screen sharing again here because we, everything you were just talking about, I actually I had to leave the page because you didn't hear it, but I clicked on your courses and you have a co- combo, but I was clicking on the attention to detail overview mm-hmm. and I didn't realize you had like a cool autoplay uh, video that happened on this page. So um, <laughs> I haven't watched it for a while. So, oh yeah. So you have YouTube oh, embedded here. I, I'm going to get ready just in case it's, it tries to play on and mute it, uh, but it autoplayed when I was there. So anyway, so do you find like this is one of the biggest things you guys push it um, is a lot of people, people going. Yeah. A lot of people get the online course. It's a, it's a really good value for the individual. So like if you're a smaller company, you can't really afford a workshop or that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, or if you just have, you know, one person that that's usually what happens for the online courses is that it's either an individual employee who, you know, they got a review and they were told, you know, Hey, you need to be more detail oriented. Yeah. Or it will be a manager who says, hey, I have one, two, three, four, five, whatever people. And they're awesome. They just make quite a few mistakes. It's yeah. you know, He's trying to, like, trying to hone the team, you know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they'll do this or um, typically they'll do a certificate course, which is created for the four companies because it actually has a little quiz and it, you know, it's timed. So uh, the managers appreciate that. So they, oh, they have something they can print. Verify. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I'm actually, I'm working that on would be the certificate course, course bundle. Is that what that is? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I'm working on another one uh, that is more like the, the live workshop and includes exercises and, and a lot more. And it's, you know, it'll be three hours long in the, in the uh, online course version. So, okay. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And since I'm already screen sharing, Boom, you're on Amazon. <laughs> Improve attention to detail. That's yeah. it. Now, is this your first book? It is. All right. I mean, I've, I've published stuff that's just like booklets, just little stuff. But okay. as far as an actual book that I put tons of research and didn't just sort of, uh, yeah. you know, throw my thoughts down on paper, this is, this is the real one. Well, that's exciting. I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, actually I was, uh, the doctor I had on the priors episode, he, he's also a multi-author award-winning author. Cool. And, uh, I'm actually working on also completing my first book. Nice. So, All right. Already written it. I just had to finish editing it. And okay. that is, uh, well, I can recommend a great editor if you, if you want me to send you a link later. Well, I have to, so fun, fun book segue. You could probably t- talk to this too. I have to f- do my edits first. 
before yeah. I even bother trying handing it off to any other professional editor because I have right. to make sense of it. And right. once, so I, I did a hack. I didn't want to write because I travel too much. I do too much business. So I voice transcribed the entire book. <laughs> I did a lot of that. Uh, yeah. And the problem though is when you export the files, <laughs> there's no structure. It's so like phase one of editing was just breaking them up into paragraphs. Like, yeah. cause I basically exported each text file, then imported it into word. And then, so I have all, every chapter is its own word document. So then okay. I go, and then phase two was going back and then building other paragraph structures, finding, and then just running a quick like spelling and grammar check. Yeah. But then now phase three is actually reading through each chapter and realizing right. my quick guess on paragraph structure is off. These sentences were not perfectly voice transcribed. So I have to go back and think about, okay, what was I trying to say here? <laughs> so I don't know if you went through any of that, but uh, uh, yeah, a little bit. So much fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm excited because it's your first book, right? Like you're probably excited, but you have to admit it's, okay. it's, it's some work. It's, it's not easy. So it's a lot of work. It took me, I mean, I wrote, I wrote, I got to the kind of 90% line like yeah. 10 months ago and it was great. Cause I was, you know, I told my wife like, man, I'm, I'm almost done. I'll be done any minute now. And then, you know, that's what you yeah, think. <laughs> take another 10 months. And the editing part, man, when the topic is attention to detail, it, the, there is a little bit of extra stress on the, on the editing part. I was so, going to say, that's your brand? You probably had your yeah. own self-pressure on that one. A little bit. Like that easily added four months to the whole thing just because I was going, come on, man, I can't get this right. So, <laughs> you know, I edited it and I had somebody else edit it and then I had somebody else edit it and then I edited it again and then had it checked over again. In mm. addition to like Grammarly and all the things uh, that, uh, that you use. So yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I also use Grammarly. So. Okay. I was going to say that's, man, that's a fantastic. Tool. That is a great, the only thing that sucks about it is you got to be carefully how much you enable that thing. Yeah. Because I had to turn Grammarly off when I'm, when I'm launching blog articles or these podcasts, the back end of the site, Yeah, like it's trying to run the whole time on the browser. Right. And, right. Right. And it just slows everything down. And yeah. uh, I was like, what is going on? And I, I just bought an upgraded computer. Literally, I just got done installing it yesterday. And I've tested it on there and it's still doing it. it it's like, oh, wow. it's the extension on Google Chrome. I don't know what it is. So I got to be really careful where I want to use it and where I don't want to use it. Because yep. it is, a, it, I will say, they've developed a really robust system and it's quite effective. But totally. depending on your system resources. Now, granted, I, I have 16 gigs of RAM here. You think it'd be fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> talking computer speak. So, uh, so, so what are you expecting out of the book, man? Cause your blog article you released on the 18th. So that was, you and I are yep. recording today on the 29th. So the blog article has yep. been up 11 days. What, what is the, what is your target audience for the book? Is it just like your seminars? What is yeah, your, it, it's individuals, it's employees, individuals and teams. So okay. it, it's, um, it is there to, to lay it out and, you know, obviously it, it lends a little bit of credence to, to what I'm doing and working on. And, uh, so yeah, but I did, I did put pretty much everything in there and I, I want people to get something out of it and, and, uh, I make myself available. I mean, there's a page that says, if you have more questions, reach out to me. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where my mission is to, you know, drive everyday excellence in individuals and organizations. So well, I love the graphic is like right now, again, people listening can't see this, but I'm screen sharing the, the graphics from Amazon. So this is on Amazon, ladies and gentlemen, this will all be linked in the show notes so you can easily find it. Um, but you, you went with basically it looks like a ball of yarn or mm -hmm. a, a, a string of yarn leading to the ball, but the ball is the center of the light bulb. So yeah. what was your graphical representation or why did you choose that? Cause it, I get, I peek out about stuff like that. So. Yeah, no, it, it's because, you know, a lot of times when people think about attention to detail, it is, it is that whole get it right or wrong. They, they tend to think more in terms of a contrastive mm -hmm. kind of mindset, you know, whether things are lined up and straight and, uh, and I, I wanted something that gave a little more of the idea of, no, we're trying to create solutions and ideas here out of kind of the chaos of things, you know, so, ah. um, finding what's meaningful and pulling it together and, and that is our solution. Okay. So, so basically the symbolism of the bottom of the book, you got like the, the messy, all different colors of yarn. And then you have that right. one thick red thread coming out, yep. falling into a ball. And there's yeah. your, there's your innovation, right? Yeah. You're saying actually kind of interesting back to your three points here. 
some people jump right to the contrastive when they should be spending more time in the additive or that innovation phase? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. There, a lot of times should be a little more attention paid to the analytical. And then, and then once they've done the analytical, you know, what I try to get people to do is how can you make that more contrastive for the next guy, you know, for, for the next person that comes along, because it's about, it's largely about the efficient allocation of your mental resources, right? So, you know, think about people working in an office setting. They have all these different things to do. If you can, if you can get the right systems in place, even if some of those systems are in their head or, you know, just maybe it's software, maybe they're checklists, maybe it's just repetition, then that person can perform their task without having to think so hard about the task itself. They can focus on, on the delivery of the, of the solution or the answer and not like what's next. You, you, you really, man, you got, you got to get that strengths final 2.0 and check that out. I've been really okay. interested in your, what you thought of that because cool, again, really. you got it. You got to unfortunately buy the physical book brand new because you need the code, right? And you bought That's it funny. used the codes already been used. And so you can't get your own personal profile, but right. you, it's a lifetime membership. You get to go back and, Get access cool. to your data, go through it again. But I'm literally thinking about how I've worked with teams and there's certain people on the team that their job is to be the additive, right? Oh, yeah, there's certain people that their job is once it gets further down the process to be the contrastive. Yeah. So if you can then discover what people's natural strengths are that they bring to the table, align the strengths with your formula, mm -hmm. I mean – wow, man, you're talking about building like super teams. Yeah. Uh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm going to see, I'm seeing a perfect piggyback here. And I mean, cool, again, man. to the listeners out there, if on Amazon, here's a hack. If you buy one book, buy the other book, because then you start creating a direct association. So Amazon has an algorithm right. where it looks at books that are bought along with other books. So if, cause I've been promoting strengths, strengths founder 2.0 for a while. So yeah. if people start buying that book and they buy your book in conjunction now mm -hmm. you teach Amazon that there's an alignment there. And then, hey, man, you get to piggyback off of the sales success of StrengthsFinder 2.0 and you start I'm boosting. All for it. <laughs> so now we're getting in this little marketing hacks. <laughs> I'm all for it. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Amazon's a beast. And unfortunately, you got to play with it. So, um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Just well, the listen, process of setting the book up for that is pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually in a mastermind group that shows you how to self-publish using Amazon. So I'm actually going to be self-publishing this on Amazon. So, okay, cool. Uh, again, I got to finish editing first. Uh, <laughs> well, listen, Chris, I love it. I'm excited for the new book. I'm glad it's up and we're definitely going to try and promote the heck out of it for you. Thank you. Uh, the good thing is all my new podcasts, I, I get them out within 30 days. I don't like to have podcasts too far out. So you're going to be up in the next three weeks. You'll get a notification when we go live. But, but for the listeners, I mean, you got a lot going on. You got the new book, Improve Attention to Detail again, ladies and gentlemen, right? You got the core brand driving this, right? The attention to detail mm -hmm. uh, dot com. So if you had to sum up, is there some kind of like all encompassing message? Because again, I know you're kind of lean more towards the business, but I totally see this applying across our domains of health and business and lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, and I, the biggest thing that I keep having in the back of my head is I'm picturing people being overwhelmed. Sure. So I don't know if that helps you figure out what you want to help or, or as the guest co-host today, close out the show, but what would you like to leave behind for the listeners? Yeah. You know what? That, that actually, that's a perfect intro for, for kind of what I like to leave people with. And it's when I'm talking about attention to detail, people tend to think that we're just talking about what's right here. And you, you know, people can't see me kind of like, you know, focusing on the desk, but his hands are like pressing downward, ladies and gentlemen. So yeah, like people think that, okay, we're just talking about getting these little things right or having the line straight or the product right or whatever, but you always have to keep the big picture in mind as well. And the big picture means different things, to different people, right? It could be your goals, your personal goal, um, your, your, you know, the company mission or whatever it is, the project mission maybe, but the details get you where you're going but it's so important to keep that goal in mind because that's where you're going. The, talking all about the details all day long, that, that won't set the sights out there. So you've always got to have the goal, the goal set out there, whether that's a place or a time or, you know, an objective. And then the details are what take you there properly and efficiently and successfully. So I always like to make sure people understand that the two are, uh, 
not mutually exclusive in conversation or in reality. It's a direct correlation. Absolutely. You, you need one for the other, you know, in order to achieve it successfully. So, uh, yeah, big picture. Make sure you keep that in mind however you do it with whatever system you use, you know, planners or whiteboards or whatever. So. Post-its. <laughs> Post-its. <laughs> right. no, I, I love it. I couldn't have asked for a better way to have you close out the show because we talk a lot about motivation and inspiration. And there's so many amazing guest co-hosts who come on here like yourself. And there's so much content and knowledge being shared. And a lot of it can get overwhelming. Yeah. And I think the most you simplified it is that, great, granted, you've outlined you know three key areas, right? Contrastive, analytical, and additive, just to refresh at the end. But the biggest takeaway I'm getting right now is that if you guys haven't documented the goal or the goals that you're trying to end up with, you know, that needs to be on the forefront because yeah. there's so many of us that do get, get stuck in the details. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually a, a common quote that I use is the paralysis by analysis. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You're spinning, you're spinning your wheels, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm loving it. I couldn't ask for a better way to close up the show. We're hitting on goals, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, listen, Chris, Hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he, he crushed it throughout the show, but nailed it in the end, man. Goals, people, okay? Get them out there. Get them documented. Put them on the forefront uh, because we don't want you spinning your wheels. We want you guys to get past that paralysis by analysis and make sure that all this hard work you're putting in, whether it be your, your health or your business or your lifestyle, that you're actually getting closer to that goal that you've documented. So thanks for tuning in to another Little Fuel, ladies and gentlemen. Again, we're here to fuel your health, your business, and your lifestyle. Make sure you check out attentiontodetail.com. He's got the information about his book on there. But again, when we air the show, it'll be on livethefuel.com. And you'll be able to easily click and get improved attention to detail now on the digital bookshelves. So again, ladies and gentlemen, you too can live the fuel. And we'll talk to you guys again soon.